if you haven't finished the exercises yet, or if you still have issues with logging in, then uh, you can just continue with those exercises later on. That's no problem for now. Um, so let me get back to the slides. So uh, I've now told you about the, the Linux command line interface, how that works, how to transfer files to and from a cluster, uh, how to edit files. So that's the, the basically the basic knowledge you need uh, in order to work with the cluster. Um, so in this second part, I will be talking about what you can do in a computer cluster. Uh, so what kind of uh, applications can you run? Um, how does the storage look like? I already told you a bit about that in the first part as well. Um, how to use the module environment. That's basically what we use to uh, offer all the different uh, pre-installed applications to you. Uh, and finally, the most important part, of, of course, is how to actually submit your workloads to the cluster. Um, and for this, you will have to write a script that basically is a kind of recipe that tells the system what you want to run and what kind of resources you need for this. Um, and then you just hand over that script to the scheduling system. Um, so the basic workflow on a cluster looks like this. So first you connect using SSH, so for instance with mobile XTERM, to one of these uh, login machines, uh, where you can basically start defining what kind of tasks you want to run. So you have to write a script, as I just mentioned. Uh, then you hand over that script to the scheduling system, and that basically is like taking a number, uh, because there are lots of users, lots of jobs, uh, only a limited set of resources. So uh, if there are resources available for your job to start, uh, it might start right away, uh, but sometimes it's too busy and then uh, the resources are not available at that moment. And then you will have to wait in the queue for a bit and uh, well, wait for other jobs to finish and then your job will start at some point. Um, so when it starts running, the scheduling system will basically just uh, start the, the script that you've given on one of those available machines. So again, the cluster consists of lots of machines and any of the, any one of those uh, machines could be running your job and you don't really uh, know which one and you probably don't really care anyway, you just want your job to run somewhere. Um, and when it starts running, then uh, already at the beginning, it will start producing output. Uh, so any output messages or error messages will appear in, a, uh, in a, the log file of the, of the job where you can find all those messages. Um, but besides that, that log or output file, uh, you may also get other results and that depends on your job. Uh, so you could, uh, for instance, generate images or videos or uh, other kind of text files, uh, depending on what kind of application you're running. Um, and well, already while a job is running, you could already have a look at those files, but uh, especially when, when the job has uh, finished, it's always good to take a look at the files and see if they look as expect expected. And um, well, maybe you find some issues with it. Uh, you may want to change some parameters and rerun the job. Um, but at some point, maybe you're set satisfied, uh, satisfied with the results, and then you can uh, copy them back to, for instance, your own machine. Um, oh, why did that happen? Yeah. Um, so the Gearshift cluster uh, consists of th these machines listed in this table. Um, so a bunch of uh, compute nodes or uh, well, one node basically is one computer, one machine, and uh, each machine or each node has, has a certain amount of uh, cores. So in this case, that's 22 cores per uh, node, and that means that it can basically do 22 uh, tasks at a time. So if you have a simple task that will take up one core, so in principle, it could do uh, 22 tasks in parallel. Um, that also means if you only just request one core, then uh, you just get one core on that machine, but the other 21 cores are still free and can still be used for other jobs that request those. Um, then there's a bunch of uh, memory, a uh, bunch of storage attached to that machine, uh, and certain features. That means which file systems, for instance, this machine can access. Um, then on all these machines, you can use the pre-installed software. And as mentioned before, we offer those as modules. Uh, where a module is basically a kind of pluggable, pluggable um, 
um, but yeah, module which you can load or unload whenever you need it, and you can switch it, for instance, to a newer version. And uh, the system allows you to basically uh, pick whatever software you want to use and specific versions of that software. So for many applications, you will find that there are multiple versions available, and you can just pick uh, whatever version you want to use. And you load that into your session basically by using the module uh, tool. Uh, so when you log into the system, you don't really have uh, access to uh, a lot of applications. So you first have to load those. Um, how does that work? Well, you have this module command, uh, which works like this. It looks a bit difficult like this, but in principle, you can just load module, uh, and then it will print some help and show you how the command looks like. So I can uh, try to show you that on Peregrine. Uh, let's get out of here, go back to here. Um, so on Gearshift, it will look a uh, little bit different since it offers different kind of applications, uh, but on Peregrine, uh, we use a similar system, uh, but only different kind of modules. Uh, so in principle, it work, will work the same way on uh, Gearshift as well, uh, only that you have different kind of uh, applications. So if you run module avail, that will show you which modules are available on the system. So that basically means all the applications that we've already pre-installed for you, uh, you can find them in those in this list, and you can just uh, look for whatever you need. Well, as you will see, uh, I'm not sure how many there are on Gearshift and other UMCG clusters, but on Peregrine, there are quite a lot of modules. Uh, and this first part was only bioinformatics, and then you get other categories of, of applications. Uh, so usually, you don't want to go through this entire list. Uh, that will take far too long. But uh, well, suppose you want to use uh, one of the, the tools in this list, uh, you can just uh, f uh, look for the specific tool that you want to use. So for instance, uh, let's say I want to use this uh, stacks tool. Uh, instead of going through the whole list, I can do module avail stacks. And then I only get the same kind of output for uh, modules matching this, this keyword that I've given here. Um, so now I can load one of these modules, so I can pick whatever version I want to use. And for loading the module, you don't have to remember all, all these subcommands that I'll show. If you ever forget about it, you just type module, press enter, and you get some help over here, which explains the module command. Um, and if you forget how to load the module, for instance, you just look it up here. Uh, loading a module can be done with either module load or module add, which is the same thing. So I can do module load stacks, and then I can either do it like this, uh, but since there are multiple versions, this doesn't really guarantee which version I will get. Uh, when I run it now, I will get the one here marked with the D, where the D means default. Uh, so in this case, the most recent version is the default one, um, but the default may change. Uh, when we install new version, that might become the new default. And this could be a bit dangerous because if you have a bunch of jobs running and maybe a few waiting in the queue and suddenly the default version changes, then your next jobs that start running uh, suddenly get a different version of that same module if you don't specify the version. So I always recommend to include the full version string over here. Um, nice thing is you can also use tab for the module thing, by the way, so it will autocomplete the name of the module for me. Um, so this is how I can load the module. And once I've done that, I can start using that application. Now, I'm not familiar with this application. So I don't know which commands it has. I guess something like stacks something. Um, so apparently, uh, also for this auto-completion works, but apparently I can use these tools from the stacks module. So for instance, this one is apparently a stacks command. Um, and I can run this. I don't know how that works. I could probably do this. No, no not. But I can probably just uh, run it on some uh, input file. Um, so I can do whatever I want with this module, and uh, I can verify that the module is actually loaded. That's another module command, module list, that will show me which modules I've loaded at the moment. So you will see that indeed Stacks is loaded, but Stacks itself also depends on some other modules, for instance, on some compilers, on some mathematical libraries, and some other kind of libraries. Um, you don't really have to worry about that that will all be done automatically. So it will automatically load all those dependencies for you. Um, the only annoying thing is once you start unloading stacks, so suppose you don't need stacks anymore and you want to uh, disable it from your environment, you can do module unload stacks. 
and now I don't have to specify the full version because I can only load one stacks at a time. So if I unload stacks, it's clear that this one has to be unloaded. Um, so if I now do module list again, you will see that stacks is gone, but it doesn't really know if it can safely also unload all the dependencies. So those won't get unloaded automatically. Uh, that's slightly annoying, um, but well, that's just how it is. Um, if you want to get rid of those, uh, of all those loaded modules, you can just do a module purge and it will just unload all of them. So if I now do module list again, you will see that there are no modules loaded anymore. And if I try to run that stacks command again, I will now get an error because now the system doesn't know uh, where stacks uh, is located anymore uh, because I removed it from my environment. Doesn't mean that I completely remove the whole application from the cluster or something like that. So the module command just basically sets up some variables so that the system knows where to find uh, the right stacks installation for you. And that will allow you to pick uh, whatever version of stacks you will need. Um, something else you should uh, be careful with. Uh, for most of these modules, uh, you will see some kind of uh, suffix here at the end. For instance, uh, you will see lots of uh, modules with FOSS and then some version, um, where this FOSS basically means how we installed that uh, particular application. Um, and that relates again to those compilers and libraries that I just uh, showed you. Um, basically, those compilers and libraries are part of what we call a tool chain, where FOSS is the free and open source software tool chain consisting of open source libraries and open source compilers. Um, so this basically tells you what we have used, which version of compilers we have used to install this particular application, which shouldn't really matter to you, uh, except that uh, you should always pick uh, modules uh, if you want to load multiple mod modules at once, you should pick modules that have the same kind of suffix here. So if you load one with FOSS 2018A, you should not try loading another module which has, for instance, FOSS 2016A, because then you try to uh, load multiple versions of the same compiler, uh, compiler but uh, different versions of the same compiler. So uh, you basically get conflicting versions, and that will most definitely break stuff, and you will get weird errors uh, when you try to run one of those applications. So try to stick to modules which have the same kind of suffix here at the end. Then you are sure that they are based on the same kind of libraries and compilers which should be compatible with each other. Um, so that's module avail, list, load and add, unload uh, and purge. Uh, there's also spider, I didn't show that one. Spider is also a, a kind of search command, uh, which will also allow you to uh, search for modules in a slightly different way. Uh, and then you get a different kind of overview. Uh, also sometimes works a li little bit better if you search for, uh, for instance, uh, very short module names, then you get uh, more often get what, what you're looking for than uh, with module avail. So this might so work uh, very well for you. Uh, plus, you get some more details about that particular module with some explanation about, uh, well, what this particular application is or does. Um, so back to the slides. Um, so this is what I already more or less mentioned about the, the tool chain. So there's FOSS, and uh, sometimes you might see Intel. I don't know if there's lots of Intel stuff on GearShift, um, but Intel is a, an alter alternative to the free and open source uh, tool chain, the FOSS tool chain. Uh, Intel is based on the commercial Intel compilers. Um, but on Peregrine, we mostly use FOSS, I think, on Gearshift, Gearshift probably as well. Um, and those tool chains, uh, as mentioned before, also make sure that you automatically get all the right dependencies, so you don't have to worry about that yourself. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so this is another example um, where we want to use this bioinformatics tool called BetTools. Uh, there are multiple versions in the module system, but when you don't load a module, you will get an error message that BetTools cannot be found. So you first have to load the version that will set up the environment for you, and then you can uh, run the BetTools command. Um, but also BetTools has similar kind of dependencies as uh, the stacks one that I just showed you. Uh, so also here, after unloading bad tools, you might have to get rid of the other ones as well. 
Um, so you will probably see that lots of the, the popular applications are already available as modules, um, but sometimes you want to use something new which was not installed yet or something uh, well, no one else apparently asked about yet. Um, in most cases, there are two options. You can either try to install it yourself in your home directory or maybe in your group's directory, um, which has the advantage that you can do it yourself. You keep control over the software. Uh, so at any given point in time uh, when you want to update or remove the software, you can just do that as well um, without any special privileges. Um, the disadvantage uh, could be unless you would install it in some group directory share with others that only uh, you can use the software. Um, the alternative is that you install it as a module, but uh, this has the, has the disadvantage that you cannot do it yourself because uh, you need special privileges in order to install to that uh, special tree where all the modules are being installed. Um, but you can, uh, for Peregrine, you ca can ask uh, our service desk and for the UMCG clusters, you can ask the GCC uh, help desk to uh, install some application for you as a module. Then basically anyone uh, using the UMCG clusters can use that module as well. So if it's something which you think could be popular and could be used by lots of other users, then uh, that's probably a better option. Um, so on to the next part for, of this workflow. How do you actually set up those jobs and submit them to the queue? Um, well, first of all, you have to write some kind of job description. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is some kind of recipe that tells the system what you want to run and uh, what kind of resources you need for this. Um, then you hand over that job description to the scheduler. And the, the scheduler is basically the, the software layer that uh, handles all these incoming jobs and controls all the resources of the cluster. So it knows exactly uh, there are this many machines with this many cores. And at the moment, this job is running on that machine for uh, approximately this long. Um, and then there are so many cores still available. So those can be used by uh, those other jobs. Uh, so it keeps control over everything that's happening on the cluster. Um, and it tries to do so in an optimal way. So it tries to uh, put as many jobs uh, on a machine as possible in terms of the number of uh, cores that are available. Um, so not to waste any resources. Um, but at some point there are just too many jobs uh, running on the cluster and then uh, new and incoming jobs may have to wait in the queue. Um, and then also this queue is handled in a, a specific way. It basically looks at how much uh, each of the users that are submitting these jobs have been using the system already. And the user uh, who's used the system uh, the most will get the lowest priority on uh, in the queue. Um, so, so that more or less guarantees that everyone can make use of the cluster in sort of uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, same amount. So users who have been using it a lot will, will be slowed down a little bit by uh, giving them lower priority. And if you're just a new user of the system, your priority will still be quite high. So your jobs will probably start sooner than uh, the other jobs. Um, but you will probably notice if you start, start, submitting, lots of, uh, start submitting lots of jobs that uh, the more you submit, the longer it might take before your job starts running because then your priority will start decreasing. Um, so this whole system is based on uh, open source software called Slurm, and you can find everything about Slurm on their website. Uh, also lots of information about uh, how to write job scripts and all the different parameters that you can use. Um, so I will show you the, the most basic parameters that you will need in order to write the job script. So you will have to uh, provide some uh, Slurm options in your job script to instruct Slurm uh, what you will need for your job to run. Um, this is just a very basic example of a simple job script that will uh, make use of the, the R st statistical programming language. Um, so it will load the R module and then run a command uh, that will let R execute some piece of R code from a file. Um, so in general, the job script uh, has three different uh, sections or components. Um, the very first line of a job script should always be like this. That's a special kind of Linux instruction in a script that uh, instructs the, the system. So Linux in this case, what kind of script this is. Um, so if you've never used Linux before, then you're probably completely unfamiliar with what this means and why it looks so weird. Um, 
but it basically means that this is a bash script where bash is the default kind of uh, script interpreter on Linux system. Uh, so everything you've been doing in the first set of exercises with all these ls and, C and cd commands, uh, that's just part of bash as well. So that should just work in, in a bash script. Um, so for now, if you really don't know what, what bash means or what this line uh, means, uh, don't worry about it. In your first jobs, just always put this uh, line in there and probably for any other job you will ever submit, you will uh, be using this as well. Um, but it has to be in the script, otherwise uh, when you submit the job, the system will just give you an error saying, I don't understand what kind of script this is. Uh, you probably want to insert the following line and then it will also print uh, this line. Um, so for now, just always put this in your job script at the very first line, um, then it's clear that this is just a regular Linux bash script. And then the next sec section in your job script uh, should come right below this first line. Um, so you should put these at the bottom, for instance, then they will be ignored. Um, but these should come at the second line and, and onwards. Um, and they should all look like this. So first this hash symbol and then s batch. And usually in a Linux script, a hash symbol at the beginning of a line basically means just ignore this. This is just a piece of text that I put here, so just a comment, uh, and don't actually execute it. Uh, let me go to the chat because I heard a question. Uh, oh, it was not in the in our chat, but in the moderator's chat. Um, so I can go back to the slides. Ah, now there is a question. Uh, what is the last line? Yeah, I will get to that in a, in a second. Um, where are my slides? Yeah. Um, so the next section in your job script uh, that should come right after that, that very weird first line, uh, that's all the, basically the slurm parameters that you have to put in. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this symbol usually means ignore these lines. This is just text written by me, and uh, I just put it here for my own purposes. So don't actually interpret these lines. But if you put them at the, uh, the second line um, with this hash as batch uh, symbol, then uh, the scheduling system will look for these particular lines, and it will fetch them and try to uh, interpret them and see what you put here. Um, and there are multiple things that you can uh, define here, which will all be uh, interpreted by the Slurm scheduling system. Uh, so I will go through them one by one on the next slides and explain what all these uh, parameters mean, but they basically instruct the system uh, well, what kind of name you want to uh, give to this script and how much time you need for this job to run, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, last section of your job script, that's just regular Linux commands. So that's basically what you want to run when your job starts uh, running. Um, so you can just load the, the module that you need over here and then just start the application that you want to run, um, where, well, probably one of these commands is the one that will take lots of time. Otherwise, you probably don't want to run that on the cluster. Um, but in this case, assume that you have some kind of uh, R script that you want to run. Uh, then this is probably the most time consuming part of your script over here. Um, but you can basically put here anything that you want. So you can CD to a directory. You can make a directory if you need to make one. You can load modules, uh, etc. But at some point, you probably want to run some uh, particular application. Um, so let's go through those uh, job requirements and options that you can uh, define in that second section of the script, all starting with this hash as batch. Um, so they should come right after uh, this uh, special bin bash line. Um, well, they all look like this, I already showed you that. Um, so I will go through the most important ones. There are quite a lot of options and requirements that you can add here, and you can find all of them uh, the, the Slurm website. Um, but usually you only need a, a few of them, so I will just uh, uh, explain those ones. Um, so probably, one of the most important ones is the amount of time that your job needs in order to finish. Um, that you can put in your script by adding this uh, dash dash time uh, option, and you have to supply some value in uh, either days, hours, minutes, seconds, and then there should be a dash between the days and a column between the hours, minutes, and seconds. 
Uh, but if you want, you can leave the days out. So you can just do, uh, do hours, minutes, seconds. And I think you can even do uh, minutes, seconds, or even just only minutes. Uh, but most often people will probably use this one, hours, minutes, seconds. Um, so that's just requesting, in this case, 12 hours, or in this case, three days and 12 hours. Um, and what to remember here is that this is a hard limit. So if you ask for 12 hours, then your job only really gets 12 hours. And after 12 hours, if it's still running, then the scheduling system will abort the job and will just start the next one because it only reserves the resources for the amount of time that you ask for. Um, which is, especially in the beginning, maybe a bit annoying because you probably don't really know yet how much time you need because, well, maybe you've never run this job before uh, or maybe it didn't work on your own computer because you didn't have the resources. Uh, so you have to make some estimation. Um, now, it, you can just quite safely overestimate this value. So suppose that you really have no clue. You could, could ask for, uh, well, let's say a few days. And even if your job only needs like five hours, then after five hours, uh, if your job reaches the end of the script, then the scaling system will see that all the tasks have been performed and it will just close the job and it will not just uh, waste the, the rest of the time that you've requested. Um, so after five hours, the job will be closed and the next one can start. Um, so in principle, you can just safely overestimate this, but the huge downside of uh, overestimating this by too much is that, uh, well, basically the, the more resources and the more time you ask for, uh, the longer you might have to wait in the queue because a longer job is harder to squeeze in somewhere than a shorter job. Um, so if you want your job to start sooner, then it's better to make a better estimation uh, or more realistic estimation. Um, but again, it's always good to uh, well overestimate this a little bit in order to prevent your job from being killed while it was almost finished and you just need it maybe one hour more uh, and then you have to start all over. There will be a bit of waste of resources. Um, so especially for your first jobs, uh, just overestimate this by maybe a factor of two or even three. Uh, just make sure that your first jobs will finish and then at the end of the job you, you will always uh, be able to find an overview of how much time your job actually has spent. Uh, and then uh, you can take that value and probably make better estimations for the next uh, jobs if they are similar to the one that you submitted before. Um, and also good to mention is by default, uh, I'm not sure how it's on Gearshift, but on Paragon, we set a default time limit of only like half an hour. So that's not enough for almost any job. So it's really important that you put this uh, value in your job script. Otherwise, you get some uh, default uh, for uh, that is set on that uh, particular cluster. Um, I heard some messages in the chat, but I think Peter already answered something. Uh, yeah, I'm typing. Ah, OK. <laughs> so then I will ignore that question for now. Um, go back to the slides. Um, then the next parameter that you can put in your job script is the number of uh, cores and the number of machines or nodes that you can request. Um, and you don't really have to put this in your job script. Here you get a quite sensible default value, which is one core on one machine per job, which is for lots of jobs uh, good enough. Um, and it really depends on the particular type of application you're running. So um, one core is basically one, one computing unit on a machine, which can run one, one particular task. And if you have an application that wants to use multiple cores, then that application should be written in such a way that it knows how to handle so, uh, uh, such situations with multiple cores because by default an application doesn't know which parts of the program can run in parallel so then it will only use one core then you can request more if you want to but they will not be used by the application and that's really a waste of resources um, which yeah uh, you don't want to because it will also affect the priority of your jobs um, so only start requesting more resources if you are really sure uh, that your program can use them and that you know how to use them in the program, because often you will have to tell the program that it's allowed to use more than one core. Um, so if you are sure if and how to use those uh, multiple cores, then you can uh, put this line in your job script, hash, hash batch uh, CPUs per task. 
uh, where basically a task is then your program and you basically tell the system now for my program I want this many CPUs where CPUs uh, in this context is the same as, as cores um, so by default this is one um, but if you're really sure that you can use them you can set this for instance to two or four or eight um, up to the limit of a machine which for Gearshift was uh, 22 if I remember correctly from the table uh, so you can't go uh, higher than 22 um, and then uh, on lots of clusters you can even use multiple machines um, but that's get, that gets more tricky because then uh, the machines have to communicate over the network and in order to let this work well uh, the cluster needs a very fast uh, network between those machines uh, which Gearshift doesn't have and for that reason on Gearshift the policy is that you should not more use more than one machine uh, per job so by default the number of nodes gets set to one and uh, I don't think you can or should change this um, so you can run jobs within a single machine and ask for multiple cores within that single machine uh, if you are sure that your uh, application supports it um, if you're not sure if it's possible, it's probably best to first send an email to, uh, to the help desk and ask uh, if they can uh, help you with that. But um, if you're really sure that you can do it, then you can try increasing this number and tell your application to use uh, this number that you filled in here. So often you will need to pass some kind of option to your program. And again, that depends on the program you're running, uh, how, how this should be done. Um, but usually you can pass in some option which says uh, start this number of uh, uh, threads in parallel or use this number of cores in parallel and then you can use the same number that you specified over here um, I heard lots of questions I think Peter is answering them all let's have a quick look yeah so what is the maximum CPUs per task we could apply so uh, unless I'm yeah, that's so that's 22. That's basically, uh, you can find that again in the table that I showed before. You know how far I have to go back. Yeah, oh, that was a little bit too far. My slide is doing weird. I don't see, yeah, now I see it myself. Uh, no, no, it skipped that slide again. Not sure what happens here. Yeah, now I see it. Um, so this basically lists the resources in. Um, in Gearshift, and as you can see, the number of cores per machine is 22. So, uh, as Peter already, already answered in the chat as well, that's the maximum that you can uh, request within a single job. So, if you have a job that really can use 22 cores on a single machine, uh, you can put this line. Where is it? You can put this line in your job script and set it to 22, and then you will get all the 22 cores of a single machine. Uh, which you can use for your job. Um, then the memory uh, requirement. Oh, another question. Ah, it's Peter. Uh, another memory, uh, uh, another requirement that you can put in the job script is the memory requirement. Um, so you will also have to specify inside the job script how much memory your program is going to use. So that's not disk space, but memory really means in this context uh, the, the RAM memory. Um, and the annoying thing is that this is very hard to estimate up front because memory uh, specifications can be very hard to calculate. Um, but you have to put it in because the, each machine only has a limited amount of memory and the scheduler has to take into account this job is going to use uh, this portion of the memory, uh, which means that there's so much left for other jobs um, to prevent the machine from running out of memory. Uh, because if that would happen, then uh, basically all the jobs might crash at some point when the machine runs out of memory. Um, and to prevent that from happening, jobs have to specify how much memory they want to claim. Um, so you can put it in your job script by using uh, this minus minus mem option. And that's the total amount of memory that you will get on that single machine uh, where your job is running. Uh, by default, if you just put in a number here, it's in megabytes, uh, but you can add a, a, a G or GB, then it will be in gigabytes. So you can uh, put, for instance, here 10 GB, and then you get 10 gigabytes on that machine. Um, if you're asking for multiple cores with that CPUs per task option, you can also uh, use this option instead, uh, which has the advantage that it uh, will automatically scale the memory uh, requirement by the number of cores that you request. So if 
here you would say I want 4 uh, GB per CPU uh, and you ask for 4 CPUs then you in total get 4 times 4 uh, gigabytes for this job. Uh, so if you often vary the number of CPUs uh, this might be better because then the memory requirement scales automatically with the number of cores. Um, so I already told you this is really necessary that you uh, have this um, because by, uh, if you exceed the memory limit that you ask for then your job will also be killed because uh, well basically your job will run out of memory it will try to allocate memory which is not available and uh, only a few jobs can survive from that uh, but most jobs will just crash because there's not enough memory anymore um, and as I mentioned before, this is very, very hard to estimate upfront. So often I get the question now, yeah, how do I know how much memory to put in? Uh, that really depends on your application and your input data and parameters that you are using. So there's no good recommendation that is true for any application. So by default, uh, I would say, um, just try to use uh, and stick to the defaults. So on uh, uh, Paragon, I guess also on Gearshift, the default is two gigabytes per core. Uh, might be enough for, for lots of jobs. For some jobs, it might not be enough. Uh, but if it's not enough, your job will just crash at some point and then just try to double it and try again. Uh, that's a bit annoying, but that's not really a better uh, recommendation than just try and see what works. And at some point, you might have uh, found a good value that works for most of your jobs. So then you uh, probably get some feeling about how much you should request. But, um, yeah, again, just try and uh, see what works well for your jobs. Um, I will also show you an example later on if I have time, what happens if you run out of memory and what kind of error message you will see so that you uh, can easily recognize situations where this happens. Um, some other things you can put in the job script um, in the job properties and requirements uh, is a name. Uh, so that's of course not really required. Uh, it's only useful for yourself. If you're running lots of jobs, then uh, you could give them uh, names that, that tell you something about which job is doing what. Um, but if you don't do that, then they will get some kind of default name, uh, which often is the name of the script you're using. Um, so that's only something for yourself. Um, another thing is that for each job you're running, you get an output file that will contain all the output messages and error messages that will happen while your job is running. Um, by default, that output file is named like this. Uh, so slurm, the name of the scheduler, basically, uh, dash, and then the unique job identifier, which is just some number, one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, uh, dot out. Uh, so you get a unique file name per job because the job ID is always unique. And in that file, you can find all the messages for that particular job. If you don't want the, uh, the file to be named like this, you can change that by adding this line to your job script. And then you just specify something else over here, like uh, my output dot uh, something. Um, and then this, I think Peter already, already uh, explained this in the chat, how this works. Um, so, so this basically guarantees that your job always starts with a clean uh, environment because by default Slurm will uh, basically transfer the environment of uh, of your session when you were submitting the job to the job itself. That means any modules that you had loaded at that moment uh, will also be loaded while the job starts running and some other stuff as well, uh, which may sound convenient, but it uh, could potentially cause uh, very annoying issues with reproducibility because if your job depends on the module being loaded uh, while you submit it, uh, then maybe in a week time you will you want to resubmit the same job and you forget to load that module and then the, uh, the job uh, might, may have to wait in the queue and then finally it starts running and then it crashes right away because you forgot to load the module. Um, so it's best to always put all that stuff. So like modules you depend on uh, to put all the module load commands into the job script so that the job itself will just load the module that you need. So if you depend on, on, on a Python module, for instance, that you just do the module load Python inside your job script and not do it manually upfront, uh, uh, so before submitting the job. And this basically enforces that you have to do that uh, by, by cleaning up the environment and um, making sure that each job starts with a very clean environment. Um, oh, my slide went weird again. Yeah, and then the, 
final part of your script already mentioned that that can just be uh, or can just contain any kind of Linux commands that you want to have included. So that can be CD, make dir, uh, etc. You can throw away stuff in job scripts if you want with uh, rm or rm dir. Um, but usually you want to start some kind of application, so you probably need a module for that, and then the command to start it actually to that that application actually. Um, so this is a very simple example, uh, might not even really make sense to, for instance, put in this command pwd. Uh, I would just put that in here to demonstrate where a job will start running, um, because a job is going to start in the same directory as uh, from which you submitted it by default, and this is just to demonstrate that. Uh, but for a real job, it doesn't make any sense uh, to include this. Um, so then you can load the modules that you will need. Uh, you can, for instance, and the, the modules that you have loaded, then you will get in your output file a nice overview of all the modules that you had loaded while you were running this uh, job, uh, which might be helpful if you want to reproduce those results uh, a year from now, for instance, and you forgot about the modules that you needed. Uh, then you can always find it back in the output file. Um, and as I mentioned, then the most important command is probably uh, often the last one uh, where you really start some uh, application and uh, start crunching numbers or wh whatever you want to do. Um, so again, this full example, uh, it's a Linux bash script. Uh, the name of this job will be r underscore job because we're going to run some piece of R code here. Uh, we request one minute uh, because it's a very simple script in this case, but uh, well, you can make it as long and complicated as you want to. Um, we ask for one core, so uh, this is the default value. So in principle, you don't have to uh, add this line. Uh, it's just here for uh, demonstration purposes that it's clear uh, what this does. Um, and we ask for one gigabyte of memory and make sure that we start with a clean uh, environment over here. Um, well, and then this I just explained. So this is going to load the R module. Um, so I don't have an account on Gearshift, but I can show you this example on Peregrine. Uh, I have a very similar example over here. It's more or less the same, except that it doesn't have those lines for starting with a clean environment. Uh, other than that, it should be the same. Um, so as I will show later on how, uh, how this will work, is that you use the sbatch command to submit this job, and then you have to pro provide it with uh, jobscript.sh, that's the name of my uh, job script over here. Uh, and sbatch is the, the command and to uh, instruct Slurm, I want to submit this as a job. So if you run that, you will get a unique job identifier. Uh, so this is a unique number for my job. And at some point, my job will start running. And as you will see, no, it hasn't started yet. But once it starts running, I will get an output file here. So these are from previous attempts. I will get another one when this one starts running. But as you will see, this is 159. I don't see something with 159 yet. Yeah, now it's there. Uh, so this is the output file for my job. That means that my job has started running or maybe is already uh, finished. So I can use less, for instance, or some other tool to uh, take a look at this file. And well, what you will see is uh, the output of the PWD. So it prints the working directory, and as you'll see, that's the same as from which I submitted the job. So I submitted the job in this directory, and the job itself also started running in that directory. Um, then I did a module list, uh, a module load first uh, to load the R module, um, and then a module list to make an overview of all the modules that I've loaded at the moment. As you can see, so R is at the bottom over here. And R, because it's a program, programming language uh, uh, for which we install lots of different libraries, additional libraries, uh, it has quite a lot of dependencies because all those libraries depend on some other system libraries um, for which we have modules as well. So for R, you have lots of different dependencies, but you don't have to worry about that. The system will take care of it. Um, then it actually started running my piece of R code, which uh, I can show you if you want to, but it's a very simple uh, piece of code, which will just print hello world and calculate one plus one. Uh, so it doesn't do very exciting stuff, but you can make it as long and exciting as you want to. Uh, but it's just to demonstrate how you launch a piece of R code. Um, well, the, the, the rest is more Peregrine specific, so I will show you later on how to do that for gear shift. 
Um, let's go back to the slide. So that's the job script. Um, some other things you can use in your job scripts, um, the variables that I've showed in the first section already, uh, you can also use these in your job script if you want to. So if you need to refer to your home directory, you can use just use dollar home or even shorter the tilde that I already showed before. Uh, also dollar user, you can use those in your job scripts if you want to. Um, so then submitting the jobs already showed you that uh, in the live demo. Uh, you need the s batch command and you need to provide the, the name of the job script so you always have to store that uh, job script inside the file and that file is called the job script and that's what you supply to the s batch command uh, so for instance if your job script is named like testjob.sh uh, you do it like this um, the file extension doesn't really matter so you can name it whatever you want even .txt or you can even leave out the dot uh, whatever uh, so just test job, um, but on Linux systems, the more or less like the convention is to uh, use the .sh file extension for uh, these kinds of scripts. Uh, but again, feel free to ignore that if you don't want, if you don't like it or don't want it. Um, and if you didn't make any errors in the job requirements, then uh, the job will always be accepted and you will get a message like this. Um, so Slurm will not find issues in your actual commands at the bottom because it doesn't know how to verify those. Uh, it's very hard to verify those anyway because they might depend on modules and uh, Slurm can't check up front if you didn't make any typos in that. But it will check the requirements. So if you ask for, for instance, uh, let's say 28 cores per machine, uh, you should get an error message saying that you have invalid requirements in your job script because well, the, the maximum on Gearshift is 22. So that won't work. Um, or if you exceed the maximum uh, time limit that you can ask for on Gearshift, I'm not sure how much it is, but on Paragon it's 10 days. Uh, so if you ask for more than 10 days, you will also get an error message that uh, well, requesting more than 10 days is invalid. So uh, th then the job may be denied by the system. Um, so if you get an error here, then uh, you should go through your requirements again and see if you uh, made a mistake there. Um, but if they are valid, then you will get the job identifier and you can be sure that the job at least starts running at some point. Um, already mentioned this, so the job will always start in the directory from which you submit it. Uh, so if your job also needs, for instance, some input files and they are in the same directory, then you can be sure that you can find them there. If they're in a different directory, you will have to instruct your program uh, that it has to read in the data files from another directory, depending on where you store those. Um, well, this is not entirely true. Uh, this is from the Paragon slide, but on, uh, if you use those uh, lines that I've showed before, you, your job will always start with a clean environment, so then this is not true. Um, yeah. um, so something else that you can use, which can be very useful if you start submitting uh, lots of very similar jobs, is that you can also pass arguments to your job script. Um, which can be useful, for instance, if you have one job that you want to run on multiple data files or with slightly different parameters, um, then you can pass those parameters or the name of the input file that this job should operate on as an argument to your job script. And then inside your job script, you can refer to these uh, variables that you pass with $1, $2, depending on how many arguments you've specified here. So if you just pass one argument, uh, then you only get a $1, and dollar two will not be defined. But if you pass, for instance, five variables here to your job script, uh, you get five variables named dollar one, dollar two, up to dollar five, which will hold the value of uh, the, the argument that you've passed. And that can be useful, for instance, uh, let's say you want to run some program on uh, a given data set, then you just pass in the name of that data set, so the name of the file basically that you want to uh, have processed by this job to your job script. So suppose you have a data set one dot, uh, well, whatever, uh, txt or something. Uh, then you do s batch my jo job script data file one dot txt. And then uh, inside the job script, you call the application uh, that you want to start and pass in the name of the data set with dollar one. And then dollar one will be automatically replaced by uh, 
what did I mention here? My data file one.txt or something like that. And then you can easily reuse that job script in case you want to run the job again, but now on uh, my data file two.txt, then you just call the same job script. You don't have to change anything in the job script, but you just uh, do the call here slightly different with sbatch, same name of the job script, but now my data file two.txt, and well, then you can pass in whatever file name in the future that you want to be processed, and that should just work. Uh, oh, my mouse is funny. Ah, my computer froze, but looks like it's working again. Can you hear me again now? Yes. Ah, okay, thanks. For some reason, it froze for like a few seconds, but apparently it's fine again. Um, so this is an example of how you submit such a job. Uh, let's say you store your job script, uh, which looks like this, uh, and you give it the name test.sh. As you can see, uh, we now use this variable in here, dollar one. So this job is not going to do very exciting stuff. It's just going to print my name is, and then some variable over here. Um, but you have to provide that variable, otherwise it will just print my name is without any text. Um, but if you now run the job like this, uh, so you can provide the argument that you want to pass to the script just uh, right after the name of the script, then the job is going to run at some point, and when it starts running, it's going to print the, the name that is given to the script, uh, so it's going to replace $1 by the value that was passed here, so in this case, Ilya, and then in the output you will see my name is Ilya, and if you want to run that same job again, uh, but now with some other values, so for instance, uh, my name, Bob, you just uh, run sbatch test.sh uh, and then Bob, and then the same job is going to run, uh, but instead it will print my name is Bob. Um, so in this case, it's, it's quite simple what it's doing, but suppose you're running an application here where you have to give your application an input file, uh, you can do the same trick and then while submitting the job here, you just pass the name of the input file that you want to be processed to your script, and then the application is going to uh, process that uh, particular file. And often you will see that uh, users want to run the same job on maybe tens or hundreds of uh, similar files, and this prevents you from copying your job script uh, also ten or hundreds uh, times then. Then you can just reuse the same job script for all those different jobs. Uh, now my slide is doing weird again. I'm getting twice the same slide for some reason. Um, well, at some point after you've submitted the, the job, uh, the job will start running. So it may have to wait in the queue for a little bit, uh, depending on how busy it is on the cluster. But after a while, it will start running. And well, then of course you want to take a look at uh, what's going on, if the job has already started or not, uh, how long it has been running already. Uh, there are several ways to find that out. Um, first one is the, the command that's provided by the Slurm uh, scheduler itself, that's called SQ. Um, by default, SQ will basically show, all you, uh, show you all the jobs that are either running or waiting on the cluster uh, from all the different users, and that's probably not very re relevant to you. Uh, so in most cases, you want to limit that to only your own jobs, which you can do with this minus U flag, and then the name of uh, your user account and then you only get the running and waiting jobs that uh, you have submitted, uh, which will look something like this. So the, the job identifier again, uh, so the unique number, the partitions to which you, uh, that's basically the name of the queue where the job is running, the name of the job itself, uh, well, your username since you've provided that. And well, then here, this is probably one of the most useful ones. This is uh, the status of your job. So if it's PD pending, so then it's waiting in the queue, or R running, then it's running, and then you can see uh, for how long it has been running. Um, uh, well, this probably is an example from Peregrine, because these jobs are using 20 machines, which is not possible on gear shift. Uh, so that's often one on gear shift, probably. Um, if your job is still waiting, so PD, uh, then in the last column you will see the reason why it's waiting, where resources just means that your job uh, is at the top of the queue, uh, but it's just waiting for uh, jobs to finish until uh, 
the, the resources for your job are available. Um, if you see priority, then it means that your job is not at the top of the queue, so that is waiting for other jobs with higher priority uh, to start first. Uh, so then it might take a little bit uh, longer until your job starts, run, starts running. Um, then there's another command. Yeah, there it is. Uh, another command to uh, check the status of your job. This is quite uh, Gearshift uh, specific. And for this, you first need to load this module uh, called cluster utils. So it has a, a bunch of cluster utilities. Uh, and then you can use the CQ command, which is kind of a wrapper around the SQ, Slurms SQ uh, command, but with a slightly different output, which is uh, more informative information than what you get by default. Um, so then you get similar kind of information, but just slightly different ones. For instance, uh, when your job started running and the priority of your job, so you can actually compare the priority of this job to other uh, jobs, either from yourself or some other users. Um, but again, you get uh, just specific information for each job. For instance, uh, again, the partition and the quality of service that's being applied to your job, um, et cetera. Um, then there's another one. Uh, and this one has the advantage that it also works for completed jobs. Uh, while CQ and SQ only work for running or waiting jobs, uh, this one basically works for running, waiting, and completed jobs. Uh, not for all the completed jobs, though. Uh, usually it works for, uh, depends a bit on the, on the settings of that cluster. But uh, if you want to go back for, for a couple of years, for instance, that usually doesn't work. But, uh, but this is uh, quite useful, for instance, if you had a job that finished last week and you want to find out uh, how much time did it actually use, uh, then you can use this command. Um, so it takes the, the information from an accounting database. That's why it calls S act from accounting. Um, and you can use it in different ways. You can also, for instance, get a whole list of all your jobs that you've run uh, between certain times, for instance. So it has lots of different options that you can pass to this command. Um, but one of the simplest ways is to ask for information about one particular job. And then you have to use this minus J and provide the job ID of the job you're looking for. Um, so again, it works for completed running and waiting jobs. And this is an example. Um, I don't think you need the module for this one, by the way. Uh, so ignore that line, um, but just use S act minus J and then the number of your job. Um, and you might get lots of different columns, so it doesn't fit here on one line. So it's sometimes a bit hard to read. And also for this, there is an option where you can specify which columns you want to have included in the output. Um, but uh, by default, you get a bunch of different columns, um, which will tell you a lot about uh, when the job started. So it's a bit hard to find now, but uh, that's this column probably. So it started at 17.05, and the end time of the job was same day uh, with 17.11. So it ran for about six and, and a half, well, slightly less than a half minute. Um, well, you can find something about the, the actual resources it used, um, on which machine it was running, and again, the job name, etc. Well, you can see it all here. Then there's another one, and that's mostly about the, the resources that the job used and how efficiently it did that. Uh, so SJEF, that basically stands for S job efficiency, uh, where again, you have to pass in the job ID with the minus J option. Uh, and that looks like this. Uh, so then you get the job name, uh, the amount of time that you requested and the amount of time that you actually used. So uh, you can see if the time limit that you had was uh, well, estimated well or not. Um, it also shows you how uh, well you have been using the different cores that were assigned to your job. Uh, with one core, it's not that exciting probably, uh, unless this is also for one core even uh, very low, then something weird is going on, then basically your job was not using the processor, so it wasn't really crunching numbers, but apparently doing lots of disk IOs or uh, reading from disk or writing from disk. And then the the, uh, performance to the disk was apparently too low to uh, get a high efficiency here. Um, but this is especially uh, worth checking this number if you're asking for more than one core, because if you would ask for four cores, uh, then this allows you to see if you actually used all those four cores or not. So then the efficiency should really be high enough. Um, and if you see only a, a quarter of the uh, percentage being used, then that basically means that from those four cores, you only used one. So that 
probably means that you uh, or your application was only uh, using one core all the time and you shouldn't be requesting four. Um, and the same for the memory uh, that you request, it will show you how much memory you actually use. So again, in a percentage, um, so if you ask for lots of memory and you only use like 10%, then uh, it's probably better for the next job uh, to reduce your memory limit uh, so that other jobs can use that memory. Um, so what happens when your job finishes? Um, so by default, you get this output file for your job with all the output and error messages, and you can uh, check that file if anything weird happened to your job. If it crashed for some reason, then you can find the error messages. Um, so I already mentioned this before. So this is the default name of the output file, slurm job identifierout but you can change it if you want. And that file already gets created when the job starts running. So basically after like uh, a second or so after it has started, you should already see that file uh, and new output might get appended to the file while it's still running. Um, so when you see that file, it doesn't mean that your job is already finished. Uh, it might still be running. So it's always good to verify that with, uh, for instance, SQ and find out if the job uh, has really finished. Um, I'm not sure if Gearshift actually does this. I don't know if Peter is still around, uh, and then maybe he can add that. But on Paragon, we always also print some kind of job summary at the end of that file. I don't see or hear Peter, so, uh, well, it uh, doesn't really matter for now. Uh, but uh, you might get some some uh, some message at the end of the uh, job output file, uh, for instance, about acknowledging the use of that cluster or uh, other kind of information. So if you see that message, then you're also sure that the job apparently reached the end and is, uh, has finished in the meantime. Um, but another way to find it out is, uh, again, use SQ, for instance, or one of the other tools uh, that can also tell you if the job has finished or not. Uh, so with SQ, since it only uh, uh, shows you the, the running and waiting ones. Uh, if you don't see it in the list anymore, then you can assume that the job has finished. And then finally, uh, sometimes you may want to run something, or you may want to cancel something uh, that is already running or still waiting in the queue. If you, for instance, find out that you made a, a mistake or a typo, um, then you need the s cancel command, which you can just provide with a job ID, and then it will uh, stop the job from running. Um, so how does that work? Uh, you submit a job. Uh, after you've submitted it, you can just even log out from the system if you want to. And uh, well, maybe after a day or so, you come back and you uh, decide that this job uh, shouldn't be running anyway, uh, and you want to kill it. Uh, then you can use the SQ command or CQ uh, to find the job ID of the job that you want to kill, for instance, based on the name. And then use S cancel with that job ID, and then it will just be killed uh, and uh, removed from the uh, from the cluster. Um, there are also some ways to use SCAN to uh, uh, to cancel lots of jobs at once. Um, so you can, for instance, say uh, just cancel all the jobs from this particular user, where it, of course, only accepts your own username. So you can try uh, canceling other people's job, but that uh, won't work. Um, but you can use this for your own username if you, uh, for some reason, decide that all your jobs should be canceled. Uh, then this command should work. Um, there are some other flags. Uh, for instance, you can filter by state. Uh, then you can say kill all my pending jobs. Uh, and there are some more uh, which you can look up in the documentation of this command. There are lots of options that you can use to filter uh, for specific jobs. Um, so if you have questions about using Gearshift, you can send an email to the, the HPC help desk from the UMCG. Uh, there's lots of doc documentation on the website. Um, if you want to use the Peregrine cluster, uh, we also have our own uh, support uh, channel. Uh, that's HPC at rug.nl. So we can also help you. Uh, but with Gearshift specific questions, you should go to the UMCG help desk. Um, so some useful links. If you want to know more about Linux commands and the Linux shell, uh, there's some links here that you can use. Uh, there should be a link to Slurm. So uh, if you want to know more about the S cancel command, for instance, you can find it on the Slurm website. Uh, especially the last link here can be useful because that explains all the S batch commands, the S uh, cancel, SQ, etc. So there you will find all the options for those commands.
Um, so that's it, except that I wanted to show you one more thing I remember now about a job that runs out of memory. Um, so let's quickly do that. Uh, I think that's a MATLAB job. So here I have a job script that is supposed to start MATLAB. So that's a mathematical uh, a program for mathematical uh, calculations. Um, and I only request a tiny amount of memory. Yes, so only one megabyte, which is not even enough to just fire up MATLAB without doing anything. Uh, but it will demonstrate what happens if you run out of memory. Then you usually get such a kind of error where you will see some kind of killed message uh, with the name of the command that was killed. So in this case, my MATLAB command from my job script was killed by the, the system. And well, then this first error might look a little bit weird, but at some point you will see that it was killed by the out of memory handler and also in the output, uh, at least on Peregrine, this is. Uh, probably you can also get this with the S act uh, tool on gear shift, but then you will see that the state of your job changed to out of memory. Um, so if you see something like that, then you can be sure that the job ran out of memory and that you just have to bump the memory limit to something higher. Um, and I usually recommend to, well, just start doubling the limit until it works. Uh, well, with one megabyte, it doesn't maybe make sense, but if you ask for uh, two gigabytes, for instance, and you run out of memory, just try with four, eight, 16 until uh, it works. Um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, is there a command to check this quota? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. On, on Peregrine, we indeed have a special wrapper called PG Quota, but it only works on Peregrine. Um, for the UMCG clusters, I guess you would have to use the the tool from the file system itself, which is called LFS Quota. Um, but I'm not sure if Peter is already here again. Then he can maybe correct me if there's something easier to use because LFS Quota is a bit well, not the most user-friendly tool to use. Um, I can show you that on Peregrine. Um, so that works like this, LFS quota, and then you have to specify the file system for which you want to check it, and you have to provide either the user or, or the group name for, um, for, for whom you want to check it. Um, so if you do it like this, you would see something, um, in this case for my group, uh, that this is uh, the the quota and this is how much I'm using, which is not really friendly. So I can use minus h, which makes it more human readable. Then you at least get it in gigabytes. Um, but we've set it up in a slightly um, or in a way that is slightly hard to read now with this tool, and uh, that's why we created the PG quota wrapper on Peregrine, which makes it uh, readable in a much better way. Uh, so maybe Peter can uh, answer that later on in the chat if there's a better way for, uh, ah, yeah, there's something apparently cool. Um, and then for the other question, I have one cluster specific question about R uses in the cluster. When I want to install some R package by default, it wants to install to our home folder. Um, that's a good question, but it's indeed very specific to R. I can try to look that up in the meantime, then I'll get back to you. Uh, so if there are no more generic questions for now, uh, I will go to the exercise slide again. Um, ah, there's no slide here. Um, but then you can just continue with the exercises either from part one or part two, uh, if you already finished them. And, uh, well, again, just let us know if you have any questions in the chat or send us a message or raise your hand and then we can help you. 